Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and today I am really uh, excited to introduce Mark Spector, who covers the Edmonton Oilers uh, for Sportsnet. Um, thanks so much for for taking the time and, and coming on today. Happy to be here. Alex, how are you doing? Really good, really good. Um, and obviously, uh, the Oilers have been uh, doing a bit better this year, um, and and uh, or a bit better of late, so uh, excited to talk some hockey. But first, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, your career and, and what drew you to w- wanting to be a sports journalist at first? Well, it's funny. I, I grew up like every other sports journalist, right? A huge sports fan with the, of course, thinking I would be a player, but uh, never playing at any high level at any sport. I was in, when I grew up, uh, I was born in 65. So when I grew up in the seventies, you played baseball in the summer, you played hockey in the winter. They barely even had soccer out West here. So <laughs> So I played my sports. I love my sports. I grew up uh, back in those days, the Edmonton Eskimos and, and the local CFL team, same with the Argos, was a huge deal in your town, much less so than today. And I was a very staunch Eskimos fan. We didn't even have an NHL team. We had a WHA team. I fell in love with them. And, you know, I guess what happened to me is I went to university and, and started muddling around. I was wasting my dad's money. Uh, taking an arts program, and I stumbled into the local radio station, CJSR, the, the U of A radio station. And before I knew it, I was writing for, I was covering a team for them. And the guy from the newspaper comes down the hall and says, well, Spec, if you're going to those games, why don't you write them for me? And it took me a while. I wasn't too smart, but I did figure out eventually that maybe I'd found a way into a, a living in sports. Uh, I wasn't going to be a player, I can tell you that. So uh, maybe this was my avenue, huh? And and what was it like to to get started in the industry and and were you covering those Oilers teams in the eighties or were you in Edmonton at the time? Yeah, I was in Edmonton and and I was this sports editor at the University of Alberta newspaper called the Gateway. We published twice a week, um, and I was a sports editor there in like oh boy, let's say eighty eighty four eighty five eighty five eighty six. Uh, for two years and one of the huge perks was the the uh, Oilers had a PR man named Bill Tuelli media relations guy Mm -hmm. very I think wisely but also very generously he would provide the sports director at CJSR the radio station at U of A and the sports editor at the gateway with a press pass for the Oilers yeah so we're talking mid 80s Oilers here right so (laughs) I mean, I worked 60 hours a week at my newspaper for sure, but I did work even a little extra hard so I could get away and and put the newspaper business down and get out and go sit in the press box and watch those orders play. So I was absolutely blessed. Couldn't have been in a better town at a better time. Uh, you know what they say? It's the it's the intersection of, of hard work and opportunity. Uh, I found myself at that intersection through much good fortune, but I will say I worked hard enough at it. So when, when an opportunity showed up at my feet, I knew what to do with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's it been like, I know you've been at Sportsnet for a while now to, to be covering your, your boyhood team day in and day out. Well, a, a little different, you know, you, you quickly get over being a fan. Like I'm not a fan of the Edmonton Oilers. I was when I was a little kid. Uh, you can't be now. And even if you were, when I came along to start covering the order seriously, it was about 1991. And they went through like 25 years of being terrible. <laughs> so had I even been a fan, I wouldn't have been a fan much longer watching all those games. <laughs> so uh, it, it's an honor and a pleasure. And I do know the history and I don't have to look, you know, because I grew up with this stuff, uh, I don't have to look back in the record book or Google a lot of things because it's burned right in here because I watched it when I was 16 years old. Uh, so that part's good. Uh, you know, I've worked for Toronto entities now for just about 20 years. My bosses have been in Toronto and I've been working here and I've had opportunity to leave Edmonton and I don't know, here I am, man. I'm 57 years old. I'm still here. And I'm not leaving now. <laughs> <laughs> And and like you've you've been in Edmonton covering the team for so long. What's it like for the city of Edmonton and for you maybe personally to covering the Oilers to have the best player in the game in Connor McDavid, uh, night in and night out in Edmonton? Yeah, it's it's a, I mean Edmonton has just been so you know we're we've hogged this whole 
generational player thing. I mean, they got Gretzky through all of this happenstance back in the you know late seventies. Uh, he's the greatest player ever played the game. And then here you are now later on, you get McDavid and he's the, by far the best player in the world today. And who knows what we'll say when his, you know, things done. So unbelievable. Like, I don't think there's anyone here that would look in the eye and say, we're just flat out lucky in Edmonton. Uh, I will say they've, you know, I know it's been a bad team for a while. I know they're ready to win. And I, I get, I hear every day, you got to win when McDavid and Dreisel are here. And I totally agree with that. Uh, but I travel around the league and I see a lot of numbers getting retired and guys going up on the walls of fame and rings of honor and all that stuff who never even played in the Stanley Cup game, let alone won, won the Stanley Cup. And the criteria to get your number uh, retired here in Edmonton is you have to be in the Hockey Hall of Fame. So, you know, the 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 level of expectation here is high because we've had great teams. And now it's time to have another great team. They got a good team here, a pretty good team. Uh, now it's get home job, get over the top, right? Yeah, and and I, I I to go into the team on the ice right now. I I liked one of your pieces about kind of talking about how the Oilers shouldn't be going for guys like Patrick Kane, but for a Mike Pekka, or not for a Jacob Chikrin, <laughs> but a Brooks Orpic, and that the team on the ice needs to to find ways to to get pucks out of their net, not. Uh, necessarily score more uh, so the best offensive team in the league what is uh, Kel Ho- Ken Holland's approach at the deadline um, and is it is he following your advice is he looking for players to keep the puck out of the net or, or is he going to go for a guy like Kane or or another scoring player well I think he's he's trying to figure that out and he's covering both ends of that spectrum Alex right I know he's you know they talked to the Sharks about Carlson sure they did That deal to me, and I think to Ken Holland, has been unrealistic all the way along, but you got to do your due diligence and talk. I know he's talked to the Chicago Blackhawks about about, uh, Patrick Kane. Uh, Again, you know, you got to find out what the price is so you know if you can or cannot afford it. Um, As his team has evolved here, you know, we, we all look at our teams in, say, December and go, okay, I see where we're short. And it looked like they were short on defense, and it looked like they were short of depth forward and then all of a sudden they're since christmas they've defended pretty well they've got a whole whack of games where they've let in two or less and now you go well so we could go get like a gavrikov guy but if i got to give up a first and a third for him is he really that much better than what we have like is it he might be a little bit better but is it worth the price so that's we're going through this alex you and me in this conversation ken holland's going through that every day And I'm not sure he's positive, uh, you know, vis-a-vis who I need, what the cost is going to be. And when I look back at that first round pick playing for somebody else, am I going to regret that deal? Uh, All of those things are still kind of jumbling around in his head. And again, against the marketplace, you know, where is, I thought Gavrikov was going to Boston. So did everybody else. Doesn't look like he is now, right? Joel Edmondson looked like a perfect fit here. Well, his back appears to be punched. So he's not a perfect fit anymore. So you might want a particular player. That particular player might not be out there anymore. And and with that, I know Ken Holland hasn't really been trading first round picks. Is that first round pick for sure going out the door in a win now move? Or as you mentioned, is he going to be very hesitant in, in moving it out? I think it's for sure available. And I think he's ready to spend it. Uh, I don't think he'll spend it foolishly. He, you know, it's a big deal when you trade a first round pick, especially this draft, Alex. It's supposed to be yeah. the 2023 draft is considered a very strong draft. I think he'll offer his 2024 first round pick to people before he offers the 2023. Mm-hmm. But listen, you got to, everyone forgets that I know you got to win now. And I know you're trying to win a cup. Well, you got McDavid. I, I'm all in for that stuff. And I think you should sell some future. But you also have to put a team on the ice in the next few years. And in a cap system, you got to have – you can't just have guys on, on entry-level contracts that can't play, right? you got to have guys on entry-level contracts that can play. <laughs> so you can't – you know, you need – those guys tend to be your first-round picks because first-round picks are a good bet that they can actually play. They're not just some draft pick that never gets out of the AHL. So – He's he's still a general manager and he still has to feel the team here in the next few years. And 
I know all the fans and us media, we forget all about that stuff, right? We want it now. We want them to be active on July 1st, and then we want them to be active on March 3rd, and we want them to make some trades along the way. Well, I'm not sure you can have it all. <laughs> I, get, I guess to, to, to follow up on that, where do you see this team right now? Are they on the ascension? They made the third round last year. Are they ready to, to, to win the cup this year, even if it's a little deal around the edges right now are, are they good enough to win the cup well they're certainly good enough to get out of the west and this isn't me predicting that they will but i'm looking at you know, start with the pacific right who's in the pacific that that you look at and you say why well, you sure can't beat them i mean vegas is good but you can beat vegas you know edmonton walked in vegas won there i think three weeks ago so it's a good series, and Vegas is a good team. You could beat Vegas. You could beat Seattle. You could beat L.A. So Edmonton could get out of the Pacific. And now you look at who's coming out of the Central. Well, they're good teams, but at this moment, Winnipeg and Dallas, I think Dallas has one more point than Edmonton. Uh, Dallas is good. They're not great. Winnipeg's very good. They're not great. Colorado, last year you looked at Colorado, and what did Daryl Sutter say? He said, you go play Colorado it was eight wasted days, right? And and it was for the Edmonton Oilers eight wasted days. It's not eight wasted days against that team now because they got a bunch of injuries. They're not quite the same team. So could Edmonton get to a Stanley Cup final? I think they could if things go their way. If they get a little luck and they have good health. Now we're going to talk. Can you beat the Boston Bruins? Well, I'm not making that prediction until the Boston Bruins get through the East. And if they did, you know, Boston's mighty good. But once you're in the cup, you're in the cup, right? Yeah. I, I wanted to, I, I've I've been doing a bit of digging and I see that a lot of like the teams that have won the Stanley Cup um, in the past 15 years are always kind of top uh, in goals against in the regular season, except for one, the, the 2017 Penguins, who were a bit more of the bottom half, similar to the Oilers. And I see this parallel between Crosby and Malkin in their prime and McDavid and Dreisaitl. Do you think those two players alone are good enough with this kind of, I would say, mediocre defense to win the cup almost as like a two-man tandem? Are they that talented? Well, I mean, yes, but the addendum is they need to be furnished with enough good forwards around them, and I think they are. Like, Evander Kane's got to be healthy, right? He's huge. He's He makes this team so much better. He's a, you know, he led the playoffs in scoring last year. He only played three rounds, tied with McKinnon. So Zach Hyman is a fantastic player. Anyone who watches the Leafs out there knows that. Ryan Nugent Hopkins is having a career season. So, yeah, those, like, you know what? The Edmonton Oilers, I'm not telling you you're going to score five every night in the playoffs because I've watched playoffs for 30 years. You don't score five every night. It's a 3-2 league generally. I'll give the Oilers enough credit to say they can probably push it to be in a 4-3 game. Mm -hmm. You know, they can get to four on a lot of nights, right? They're those two guys, McDavid and Drysaddle. I mean, they're, they're otherworldly, but you still need to keep the other team to three. So you can't just say we're going in there and it's fire wagon hockey every night. Nobody wins in the playoffs like that. However, I'm going to give Edmonton a little bit of a stretch on the offensive end because clearly they're the best offensive team in the league. They've got historic power play. And, uh, you know, if they got enough goaltending and defense to hold the other guys to three, they might win more than most teams would. And with that goaltending, you had a really, you had a good piece on, on Stuart Skinner being an Edmonton native and playing for his hometown team and the journey and the confidence he has kind of in the NHL now. And obviously, as you know, Jack Campbell signed that big deal this summer, hasn't been very good. What is your level of confidence in the goaltending of Skinner and Campbell going into the playoffs this year? Well, it's a good question. Like at this point, all season long, one of them has been playing well. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> it's been very, it hasn't been a lot of the year where both were playing well. But to be honest, I only need one playing well. Only one plays at, the same, at one time. So, you know, I, I guess you get caught, Alex, between what the plan was, the plan was Jack Campbell's the number one and Skinner's the number two. And what's turned out in reality that, you know, you look at five on five save percentage, Jack Campbell isn't even at 900 yet, Oof. right? He's still at like 896 or something. And uh, Stu Skinner is at like 930 this year. So Skinner's been the better goalie. He's got the better numbers. And I don't care who plays. Like the contracts are signed, man. 
doesn't matter, right? You can't take the Jack Campbell contract back. You got it. It's five million bucks. It's I'm not saying it's you, that's too much to pay a backup for sure, but it's not Bobrovsky at ten million bucks. No. Uh, he's still a good goalie. You need to so. Listen, if the playoffs start and Stuart Skinner's in net because he's the better goalie, then my hat's off to him and let's go. If he's the better goalie than Jack Campbell, can he give him enough in the playoffs to win games? Kids never played an NHL playoff game, man. So your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> uh, and and with with uh kind of you mentioned a bit of the cap and 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 stuff, and you mentioned you wrote about Puyarvi and the Oilers not putting him on waivers and Holland kicking kind of that decision down the road as, as much as possible. What do you think will end? Uh, what will happen in the end of that? Do you think he's moved by the deadline or will he be an oiler during the playoffs? I assume he'll be moved I assume, only because he, Ken Holland is in such a cap crunch and he pull whether you like him or not, whether his name is Jesse pull or Pete Smith, he's the one player in the Oilers with a high number and very low um, production. Not the one player, but the most, you know, the guy that stands out the most. He's making 3 million bucks. He's got like 14 points or something. So as an LTI team, Ken Holland can't, he's got to move money out to bring money in. So all of those concerns come together, tell me that if Ken Holland makes any kind of trade at the deadline, you're going to see Jesse Pugliarvi going the other way. And to be honest, for the for Pugliarvi, I I can't wait to see him in another uniform. I can't wait to see him next October playing for somebody else, getting a fresh start in a new city with a new coach and a new group. Uh, that is absolutely what the young man needs in his career. How have you thought of Ken Holland's job as GM of the Edmonton Oilers? Like he's signed these big contracts, but like they don't have the most amount of cap space, of course, as you mentioned, and maybe not the best assets. Do you think he's done a good job so far kind of finding the way to, to build a contender around uh, McDavid and Dreisaitl? Well, I mean, I, I think so. You know, uh, to me, in, in the end, you judge a GM on, well, two things. First of all, results. Okay, first of all, results. He's made the playoffs every year he's been here. And last year, they went three rounds. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how anyone can look at those results and say he should be better than that, I guess. He should have beaten Colorado last year. Yeah, Colorado's been building this thing a lot longer than the Oilers have. They were ready to win last year, and they did. Now it's Edmonton's turn. Okay, I get it. So the results have been good. Um, listen, every contract hasn't been perfect. He signed Zach Cassian as a lousy contract. He had to move it along, you know. But I'd say this to you. He signed Ryan Nugent Hopkins for $5 million bucks. And the guys got 70 points and we're about three quarters of the way through thirds of the way through the season here. That's an awesome contract. He's got Zach Hyman on an awesome contract. Uh, Vander Kane was a UFA all over the league. He could have played. He brought him in here. The guy came in and led the league in goals in the playoffs and signed here at a, at a $4 million. A, I would say a pretty good number. Yeah. I know he hasn't been healthy all year. You can't blame anyone for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I guess I'd say this to you. People say he's got to go for it. He's going for it. He's going for it in the summer. He He's an LTI guy because Oscar Clefbaum's career ended uh, early. So he goes for it in the summer. He absolutely caps himself out with good players in the summer. He so much so that he started the season with a 21-man roster. That's what you call going for it. I got all my money and 21 guys. I don't have 23 guys here, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, of course, the trade deadline comes and people want him to go for it more. It's just not the way the economy works. You know, he's basically chosen to spend his money on guys that are going to play 82 games for you instead of guys that are going to come in on a white horse at the deadline and, you know, fix all your problems. So sure, he'll make a little move and a little move here and there at the deadline, but he's gone for it. He just goes for it in the summer, not in March. That's my opinion. And and going with the the coaching staff that he brought in Jay Woodcroft last year, and you had a big piece about how going into the playoffs last year, how Jay Woodcroft could maybe be the one to bring the cup back to Edmonton. A season later, how would you grade Woodcroft's coaching this year? Well, I think, uh, you know what? This is a team that scuffled along this year. 
And now they're finding their stride at a pretty good time. I mean, as we speak, they've lost one regulation game since January 11th. I think it's the 24th of February today. So, you know, it's good when a team struggles. I think a team, I mean, the Boston Bruins are a, a total unicorn. Good from game one to game 82. Like that just never happens. My hat's right off to them. Like they're a hell of a team. But when you're the orders and you're, you know, things weren't perfect and you signed a goalie and he wasn't that good. And Evander Kane had his wrist stepped on early and you lost your best left winger. And, you know, it hasn't gone exactly smooth the way you thought it would. You're not in first place, the Pacific, the way everybody said you're going to be. For the coach to get a hold of that team. And now that there's like inside 25 games left to have them starting to find their stride and starting to play their best hockey. And, you know, you watched them last night in Pittsburgh. Uh, they were five times the team the Pittsburgh Penguins are faster, better, deeper, better goaltending. You know, it wasn't even, I know, I know it was one of those nights Pittsburgh wasn't very good. I mean, it was real good, but I mean, it wasn't even a contest. So, you know what, Woody, I, I won't say Woody's not on schedule to be doing a good job. He got his team to the third round of the playoffs last year and, you know, let's see what happens this year. But if he gets them back to a conference final, I'm not sure that, there's only four coaches to get the conference final, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And and a lot of what you wrote in your, the article last year was kind of tightening up the defense. And I wanted to ask, who's, in your mind this year, been the best defenseman on the Oilers? Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, that's a good question. You know, I'm going to say, I mean, I'm probably going to say Darnell Nurse. Okay. And a lot of people. A lot of people will go, oh, my God, he makes 9.25 and he's not that good and blah, blah. You know what? He's the guy that plays the minutes. He leads them in minutes, 24, 25 a game. He plays all the toughest matchups. He kills all the penalties. Uh, he doesn't get any power, barely gets any power play time. Uh, Darnell Nurse carries, does all the dirty work back there. Does he need some help? Could he, could he use an offensive guy to play with so he could just stay on his side of center and never cross it? I think that would be awesome. Doesn't have that. Uh, is he a first number one defenseman in the league in the same way that Adam Fox or Pietrangelo or, um, you know, Carlson, the way they are? No, he's not. He's Edmonton's number one. He's not uh, number one in the league. But is he making too much money? Yeah, you know what? He's probably making a little bit too much money. He might be coming in better at eight and a half or whatever. But the point is this. He carries the load. He blocks the shots. He does all the dirty work and he takes all the guff from Oilers fans who think he makes too much money. Um, he's the best defenseman they have. And when the playoffs come, I think that'll, you'll see that a little more, more overtly. I, I wanted to, to, before we move on, I wanted to ask you about McDavid and, and in terms of this arguably might be the best career of like best year of his career. Sorry. And with already a career high in goals before the, 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 even the trade deadline, what has he done to make himself a better goal scorer? Uh, that's, you know, the one thing he's done that I can say this, I can say this unabashedly. He used to try to beat the last guy all the time. You know, remember when he was younger, remember he crashed into that post in Calgary because yep. he was trying to beat the last guy. Uh, remember when he hurt himself early in his career, the first year against Columbus? I think it was a game. Was it against Columbus? Hurt his uh, no Philly. He yeah Philly. He uh, wrecked his collarbone trying to beat the last guy. What Connor McDavid does now is he'll beat all the guys and then he'll shoot through the last guy. He he doesn't always try to beat the third guy that he's beaten. He'll settle for two. <laughs> so that's one of them. You see a lot more wrist shot goals from Connor McDavid this year. And he's learned to, you know, people say, oh, he's learned to use the defenseman as a screen. What he's learned is don't try to undress that last defenseman because it doesn't always work. What he does now is he uses that defenseman as a screen. Uh, and the rest of it is he's just growing up. He's a little bit smarter. He's every bit as fast as he always was. He's a little bit more innovative. You saw a shot off of, uh, Laurent Brassois' uh, nameplate. No, um, where'd they play last night? Pittsburgh. Tristan Jari's nameplate last night. I mean, that's not a shot you see very often. He's he, he's he's just evolved his game, right? He's evolved his game. I guess I'd say to you in conclusion, his game is there's a little less risk taking. 
and a little less high wire act. And there's a little more just solid talent and speed that he's scoring honest goals here and nobody knows how to stop him. And, and with him and dry they, you know, a lot of the critics have pointed to their defensive game and this year, they're not the most, they haven't been great five on five in terms of plus minus. Is that an area you want them to, do you think they can improve on going into the playoffs? I know in the playoffs, they were good in, in terms of their five on five play. I totally agree with that. Yeah. I've, I've written that here and taken a lot of flack for it, man. Uh, that those two guys, you know, a couple of years ago, I wrote a piece saying it's time to quit worrying about winning Art Ross trophies and start to worry about winning the big trophy. And that means the two big guys have to play better defense. And you know what? I'll stand by the piece. I ate a lot of, you know what for it. Uh, but I was right in my opinion. Uh, I, they both realize that there's no question that neither of these guys are, are out hunting for individual trophies. They're all in on Stanley Cups. There's, I have no doubt about that. And yeah, you look at the two guys. I mean, they lead the league in scoring wire to wire. And between the two of them, they are not, uh, their goal differential is below zero, right? It's in negative at five on five. So that tells you that at five on five, they're getting scored on more than they're scoring. And they score a lot. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, you in the playoffs, that has to change. Down the stretch, I think you're starting to see it change. Uh, I think it's more a dry settle thing than a McDavid thing. However, you see McDavid fly in the zone sometimes too, and I'm here to tell you. So I think they both know how to do it, and I think they both will do it. I don't think they spend enough time doing it the regular season up to date. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's that change. And and I wanted to to push forward to the playoffs who would be your Stanley cup pick today? If, if you had a crystal ball and, and, and you, you had a pick. Oh, it's gotta be Boston. I mean, they're so good. And then they just got Orlov and Hathaway yesterday. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and, and yeah, there, I mean that if the Rangers end up getting Patrick Kane, the way it looks like they're fixing to do, uh, you know, Carolina is also a very, very good team. The East has got some killer matchups going on here. Yeah. Uh, it's really turning out. I think it's a better conference and, and right now it's starting to look like a sexier conference too. Don't forget the Leafs are out there and we all watch the Leafs to see, you know, what track <laughs> that train's going to go down again this year. <laughs> if they can find track B, that wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'll be the Bruins. And, and I, just to talk about the Leafs quickly mm -hmm. uh, out of them, which Canadian team do you think will go the farthest in the playoffs? Do you like the Do you like the Leafs over the Oilers? Maybe the Jets? Maybe the Flames rebound somehow? Uh, well, if we talk about them one by one, it's I don't think the Flames have what is going on here. I'm not positive they'll make the playoffs. Yeah. Um, you never know. You know, that's my opinion. Uh, so no, not the Flames. Uh, I think you know Toronto's might be the best team in Canada. But that doesn't mean that they're going to make it through the first round when they're playing Tampa. And then they got Boston in the second round. I would say this to you. I think anyone in hockey would look at Edmonton's road through two rounds and stacked against Toronto's road through two rounds and tell you they picked the orders to go further than the Leafs. <laughs> and that's not me being a biased reporter or any of that oh. stuff. I'm just looking at the competition here. So, um, you know, I, I think the orders have a, will have an excellent chance to come out of the Pacific. I'm not going to pick Toronto to come out of their division because Boston's just too good. Mm -hmm. uh, and so thanks so much for, for taking the time and coming on, Mark. I just wanted to give you the floor. Is there anything you're working on that people should kind of keep their eyes and ears open for at, at Sportsnet or on TV or whatever the, the forum may be? Uh, no, you know what? I really, uh, Alex, I, I would love to say, oh, I've been working away on this huge series, but it doesn't work in my world right now. It doesn't work that way. I'm a day to day. I'm a daily columnist. Yeah. I hope I, I entertain you every day. I try to do something different. I wrote a piece the other night out of Pittsburgh using, remember that great Terrian rant, Michelle Terry yeah, rant? Yeah, I, I read that. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen a group so soft. <laughs> it was man's against boys. Uh, I just try to do something a little different, have some fun. So I guess I just ask people if you, if you, you know, you want to have a good five minutes on the Oilers generally read my stuff every day. I hope I entertain you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I'll definitely be uh, reading your stuff, stuff, especially going into the playoffs and, uh, 
hope they uh, bring a cup back to Edmonton this year. Uh, or maybe Toronto would be fun too. Thanks, Alex. Sure appreciate the time. Thank you so much.